Welcome to this lecture on the reliability of selection test. Reliability is a necessary but not sufficient condition for validity. Remember that because without reliable scores, a test cannot be a valid test. And using an invalid test is against the law. Let's get started. Behavioral science in general is involved with unobservable phenomenon. Measurement is the linking of abstract concepts to empirical indicators. So measurement involves both an empirical consideration that focuses on the observable response and a theoretical consideration that focuses on the underlying unobservable concept represented by the response. Reliability is the extent to which an experiment, a test, or any measuring procedure yields the same results on repeated trials. However, the measurement of any phenomenon involves some degree of measurement error. Error-free measurement is never achieved. If repeated measurements of the same phenomenon yield different readings, then unreliability is present. Consistency in repeated measurements of the same phenomenon is referred to as reliability. And error is of two basic kinds, random and non-random. Random errors are just chance factors that confound the measurement of any phenomenon. The amount of random error is inversely related to the degree of reliability of the measuring instrument. Examples of error in survey research include errors due to coding, ambiguous instructions, differential emphasis on different words during an interview, interviewer fatigue, etc. Non-random error lies at the heart of validity. It is present when the measurement test or device measures more than one underlying factor, concept, or construct. Invalidity arises because of the presence of non-random error. Let's move on. Reliability is the degree of dependability, consistency, or stability of scores on a measure, either predictors, criterion, or other variables. These measures that are used in selection research are the focus of this lecture. It's important that we emphasize that it is the score on an instrument that is reliable and not the instrument itself. We can never say that a test is reliable. Because of random error associated with the administration of a test, random error introduced by a test administrator, or a host of other contaminants, the scores may yield acceptable reliability in one sample and not in another, or for the same sample at one time, but not at another time. Let's move on. This is the foundational formula for classical test theory that suggests that any test score is a function of true score and error. That is, the respondent's obtained test score is merely an approximation of their true score. We seek to minimize the error component so as to maximize the true score approximation. By parsing out the components of this formula, we can get a better understanding of the formula. So true score is the mean or the average score made by an individual on many, many, many different administrations of a measure if external and internal conditions were perfect. By taking a test again and again and again and again, we can eventually hone in on the actual unobservable true score. The error score is the score made by individuals that is influenced by factors present at the time of measurement that distort individual scores either over or under what they would have been on another measurement occasion. Reliability is all about minimizing error. We'll spend a ton of time on that in this lecture. Let's move on. If a person has a true score of say 50, on some test, and we give them the test again and again. If their score ranges from 45 to 55 on those multiple administrations of the test, as in the top part of the graph here, the top parallel bar, then the test is actually fairly accurate. 
But if their scores range from 43 to 57, as in the middle graph, or 40 to 60, as in the bottom horizontal bar, then the obtained test score is riddled with error. This error may be from systemic, non-random error, as in a confusingly worded test, or from random error, as in unstandardized or different instructions being used on every test occasion. In some, when the errors are wide, that is big, then it hampers our ability to obtain an accurate and error-free score on the test. Given multiple administrations of a test on the same subjects, or one administration of a test to multiple subjects, subjects being people, persons, we can calculate a reliability score, which is used to tell us the likelihood of accurately determining the true score. We'll discuss methods of measuring or calculating reliability later. Of note is that reliability ranges from zero to one, and high scores are better than low ones. As the reliability score rises, the closer to the true score we get, and the smaller the amount of error. Let's move on. We have to think about several things before we choose a particular reliability assessment technique. There are several ways of quantifying reliability, but before we calculate a reliability score, we have to ask the following questions. How dependably can people be assessed with a measure at a given moment? This is actually the key question regarding reliability in general. How dependably will data collected by a measure today be representative of the same people at a future time. If we expect changes in test scores over time because of learning effects, or because we actually hope that the thing being measured will improve, for example, better job attitudes, or decrease, for example, less anxiety over time, then this will affect our choice of reliability method. How accurately will scores on a measure represent the true ability of people on the trait being measured I'm sorry, being sampled by a measure. This is a problem when a new test is being developed and it may not measure everything that it's supposed to. When individuals are being rated by more than one rater, to what degree do evaluations vary from one rater to another? This is an issue when raters are not properly trained. To what extent is an individual score due to the rater rather than to the individual's behavior or other characteristic being rated? If the rater is having a bad day today but not tomorrow, then their scores will be likely be contaminated and affect the reliability method that should be used. Let's move on. There are numerous forms or methods of assessing reliability, but these are four of the major types. There are several slides in this presentation for each of these. We will learn all about test-retest reliability, parallel forms reliability, internal consistency reliability, and inter-rater reliability. We'll turn to test-retest reliability on the next slide. Let's move on. Test-retest reliability is simply a correlation between scores evaluated on two administrations of the same test, given to the same persons spaced out over time. If the scores are exactly the same for all persons in the sample on both administrations, then the test-retest reliability coefficient would be a perfect 1.0. But that never happens. Invariably, the correlation across time varies. People change. Times change. For example, consider a test of someone's self-esteem. This construct might be important to the performance of salespersons who are faced with a small number of sales per sales call. For example, big ticket items like homes or cars. You have to interact with a lot of people before you can sell one of those. Just one of those. Suppose a person's self-esteem is low after a failed marriage and being fired from their previous job, but three years later, their score on the test of self-esteem are high. 
The test is not necessarily unreliable because the correlation between time 1 and time 2 scores is far less than 1.0, but the scores obtained from an evaluation of their self-esteem states have changed considerably over time. Of note is the difference between states and traits. Traits do not change much over time. For example, one's level of conscientiousness is not likely to change much over time. The scores obtained from a test of this personality trait have been shown to be stable over time and thus have a high test-retest reliability, but states do change, and sometimes they change rapidly, like emotional states. Factors that may affect test-retest reliability include memory and learning. You should use test-retest reliability when the length of time between two administrations of the same test is long enough to offset the effects of memory or practice. Use it when you have little reason to believe that memory will affect responses to the measure. Use it when it can be determined that, not be determined that nothing has occurred between two test administrations that will affect responses. Because most other forms of reliability require multiple items in a single test, you can use test-retest when information is available on only a single item measure if you have to. Let's move on. So here are two hypothetical test-retest examples. At time one, Friedman and friends and their test scores and rankings are in the left part of the table. In case A, they all retook the test later, and we can see that while their scores changed a little bit, their overall rankings did not. So, Friedman goes from 90, a score of 96 to a score of 90, Fukai from 87 to 89, Woodward from 80 to 75, etc. We expect some change, and in case A, the test retest reliability, and actually it's just a Pearson correlation between scores for all persons, all five persons on the test at two different points in time, is 0 0.94. This is the information in the bottom of the slide. Now in case B, not only did their scores change wildly, but so did their rankings. Now Friedman is ranked number two, and the formerly fourth-ranked T.A. Hanata is now at the top of the rankings. Friedman goes from 96 to 66, from ranking first to ranking second. Hinata goes from a 70 to an 82, that is from fourth place to first place. These wildly inconsistent changes in scores from time one to time two in case B result in a near zero correlation, and the test-retest reliability is only 0 0.7. With only five subjects, while not technically zero, it is, of course, not a statistically significant correlation. Let's move on. Parallel forms reliability is also known as, aka also known as alternate forms reliability and equivalent forms reliability. Those three words are the same thing. This form of reliability requires the creation of two conceptually identical tests. Conceptually identical. To calculate the reliability, the two forms must be administered to the same respondents almost back to back. These two versions of one test can be difficult to construct. However, in educational testing and cognitive ability testing, it is done quite often. The main difference between test-retest reliability and parallel forms reliability is the length of time between administrations and the fact that Parallel forms reliability is the correlation, correlation of scores on two different but conceptually identical instruments, while test-retest uses the exact same instrument or test both times. So this form of reliability involves administering two equivalent versions, that is, forms with different items, but that measure the same construct administering these versions to the same respondent group and the numerical value calculated by correlating the two forms of the test is called the coefficient of equivalence. The coefficient of equivalence 
is the metric used to assess parallel forms reliability and it's actually just a Pearson correlation, the good old Pearson product moment correlation. However, coming up with two very similar tests that use different questions or items involves a lot of work. The Wunderlich test of cognitive ability has two forms, form A and form B. This is so that respondents or test takers can't memorize the questions, go home and study for them, and take the test again. In order to determine if the forms are indeed equivalent, numerous test takers had to take both forms of the test and the correlation of their scores was computed. The coefficient of equivalence was computed. This was done again and again while editing items and discarding items and writing new items until the two forms were almost perfectly correlated with each other. Let's move on. Here's a diagram that illustrates the process of selecting items from a universe of all possible acceptable items. Here's the universe of items in this circle on the top left. These are all the possible math items in this basic math skills test. Think of it as writing these items and then throwing them all into the hat and randomly selecting two handfuls of items. The handful on the left would comprise test form A and the handful on the right would be test form B. If the two forms are indeed equivalent or parallel or alternate forms, then the items should be very nearly similarly difficult and very similarly distributed around the mean for every group taking the test. Ideally, those respondents with high ability or large amounts of whatever it is that the test is measuring would get the difficult items correct. And those with low ability or amounts of the construct being measured would get them wrong. Similarly, the standard deviation or the average distance from the mean for respondent scores on both forms would be similar. If on form A, the standard deviation is very small and on form B, it is very large, it indicates the scores are bunched up around the mean on form A and widely varying on form B. That would not be good. Let's move on. Internal consistency reliability is by far the most popular method of assessing the reliability of scores derived from an instrument. It is, in essence, sort of like an average inter-item correlation. Think of it as the average of all possible paired correlations for every possible pair of items in the instrument. It is a measure of how well the items measure the same thing or hang together. If the average correlation for every possible pair of items is high, then they all tend to correlate strongly with each other. So one means of increasing an instrument's internal consistency is to increase the number of items in the instrument. In fact, this form of reliability cannot be calculated for tests with only one item. For example, a test designed to measure respondents' intelligence that consists of only one item is not as likely to be theoretically reliable as a test that uses five items or 10 items or 100 items. However, this is not without its limits. As the number of items increases, the increase in the internal consistency measure, the increase in the internal consistency measure becomes smaller and smaller. Eventually, it is likely that some items simply measure something else altogether or are just written so poorly that they don't correlate with the other items very well. There are just so many ways that you can ask a person if they like the color blue or not, for example. And there are three main subtypes of internal consistency reliability. The first is split halves reliability, which splits a test into halves and is administered to respondents at one sitting. Usually this is done by correlating the scores on the odd items with those of the even items. It is not usually done for the front items versus the back items because the test is absolutely unidimensional and it measures only one thing and items do not vary in their difficulty according to placement in the test and if respondent fatigue plays any role 
when correlating the front half to the back half, you might get a lower measure than if you correlate odd items with even items. Or if the hard items are at the end, then a front half versus back half reliability is also inappropriate. The Cooter Richardson 20, KR20, is one of over 90 formulas developed by Cooter and Richardson and is a measure of internal consistencies, consistency for tests that use dichotomous data. That is, it is inappropriate for Likert responses where one equals strongly disagree, two equals agree, three is neither disagree nor agree, etc. Or anything other than yes, no questions or right, wrong questions. Now, bear in mind that a multiple choice test question is actually dichotomously scored. If A is the correct answer on a test, then B, C, D, and E are all wrong. The question is either right or it's wrong, regardless of how many options there are for the answer. Kronbach's coefficient alpha is a measure of internal consistency for tests that use ordinal, interval, or ratio scales that are not dichotomous. This is the most common form of internal consistency reliability for attitude and trait measures and other tests that use Likert responses that are not scored right-wrong. Let's move on. This diagram shows how to use split half reliability on a criterion measure job performance. Some jobs lend themselves well to this given their quantitative output. In this example, employee productivity is measured every day and the odd days are correlated with the even days. You'll notice that each person has an odd day score and an even day score. This is a simple Pearson correlation between two sets of scores for each worker. Let's look at it a little more closely. We have odd and even days, one, two, three, four, five, etc. We have the employee productivity per day. On day one, Chris did 21, Sims 19, Vera's 21. Day two, Chris did 18, Sims 19, uh, sorry, 16, Vera's 21, etc., etc., etc. For the month, Chris did 808, Sims 833, and Vera's 843. Now the odd days. The odd day score for Chris is 406, and the even day for Chris is 402. Remember, Chris had 808. Sims, 418 and 415. Vera is 420 and 423. The reliability estimate here is the Pearson product moment correlation between these sets of scores and these sets of scores for each respondent. Let's move on. Here's an example table that shows data on which the KR20 may be used. We can see in the far right column that each person's test score is shown. These scores are the number correct out of eight questions. Across the bottom row, we see the number of persons correctly answering each question. The most difficult one is question two which was answered correctly by only one person, Wiley Boyles. The easiest question is number four. With five out of six test takers getting it right. In the table itself, we see ones and zeros. A one indicates a correct response, and a zero is incorrect. One is yes, zero is no. Thus, we can tell that these scores, these questions are scored dichotomously. That is, they are wrong or right, and therefore the KR20 is the appropriate measure of internal consistency reliability. Let's move on. Here's the formula for the KR20. This formula is used to assess internal consistency of a scale that has only correct and incorrect answers. For example, students test in college might have five multiple choice response options, but only one option is correct and the other four are incorrect. Essentially, there is a right and wrong answer. The KR20 is used to assess the reliability of a test that has items, again, that are dichotomously scored. 
we can see that the KR20 is a function of the sum of the product of the probability correct and probability incorrect divided by the variance of the overall scores. Your product correct is P sub I. Uh, I'm sorry, the proportion correct and the proportion incorrect is 1 minus P sub I. That should make sense. So the product of this for each person is then summed and divided by the variance of all of their test scores. Now picture for a minute what would happen if there was no score variance. That is, variance equals zero, which occurs when everyone gets the same test score, say a 50 or a 70 or even 100. Sometimes in classes, the professor gets excited. Everybody made 100. Well, technically, if everybody makes 100, there's no score variance, and the test is completely unreliable because it does not allow you to discriminate, I mean that in the, in the proper sense, between good students and not so good students. So this formula would then reduce to zero because zero is in the denominator and the reliability of the test is zero. The numerator also reduces to zero since the probability of a correct answer is 1.0 if everyone gets them correct and the probability of an incorrect answer, one minus p, is zero and one times zero is zero. So in fact, the numerator is at its maximum when. Look at this formula. When is the maximum of the numerator? It's when the probability of a correct answer is 0.5. That means half of the people in the sample taking the test have to get it correct and half have to get it wrong. Think about that for a minute. Let's move on. This table uses data best suited for Chromex coefficient alpha measure of internal consistency reliability. This table uses four items designed to measure conscientiousness on eight persons called persons A through H in case one, and eight other persons called persons I through persons P in case two. Look at person A scores. Down the column, 4554. Five, four. They're very similar, but not identical for all four items, and they're also very high given that five is the highest possible score. Person B's scores are also very consistent, but they're low. That's okay. It doesn't matter what the mean score is. It just matters if the scores on the continuously measured items are similar or consistent. Now look at the right side of the table in case two and those applicants. Person I's scores are sometimes high and sometimes low. The same thing for the other persons, J through P in case two. This suggests that the items are not measuring the same thing or that there is some sort of major error contaminating the four item measure. In case one, alpha equals 0 0.83, but in case two, it's only 0 0.40. Clearly, the scores in case one are more internally consistently reliable than in case two. Please note that this could be the exact same test or measure given to these 16 persons. Clearly, a test is not reliable, but scores can be reliable. Let's move on. This is the formula for Kronbach's coefficient alpha. This measure of internal consistency is similar to an average inter-item correlation of all possible pairs of items in a scale if the items are measured continuously, that is, ordinal interval ratio. Usually interval or ratio, but ordinal will work sometimes too. If there are a large number of items in a scale, the formula becomes very complex. To maximize reliability using this measure, we need maximum variance on the items and on the scores, the overall scores. That is, some respondents need to provide low scores on the items, some need to give medium scores or responses, some need to show high scores on the items. Additionally, some respondents' overall test scores need to be low, medium, and high. If everyone gives the same response, to every item, then the alpha reliability is zero. 
because the score variance or variability is zero. Let's move on. Inter-rater reliability is a measure of how well more than one rater agree on a measurement. This method is often used in interviews where each interviewer will score an interviewee independent of the other interviewers. The reliability of the scores is derived from separate ratings of the interviewee and should be correlated to one degree or another. Now, sources of error include both rater and ratee. There are many, many measures of agreement between two or more raters. Here are three. Inter-rater agreement measures, statistics, include Cohen's kappa, Kendall's coefficient of concordance, and even percentage correct. Uh, I'm sorry, percentage agreement. Inter-class correlation is used for two raters on interval data on a series of targets. Examples include Pearson's R and Cohen's weighted kappa. Intra-class correlation is used when at least three raters are rating more than one target using interval data. It describes how much of the difference in ratings is true difference and how much is simply an error of measurement. The use of multiple raters is used to help counter any individual rater biases. In essence, it assesses the degree of objectivity that is present amongst the raters. Let's move on. This table provides interval data with scores ranging from two to nine on many, many ratees or interviewees. Scores on each ratee is provided by three raters or interviewers. This is best suited for the intra-class correlation coefficient. If you really want to dig in deep, there's a classic article, article by Shrout and Fleiss in 1979 published in Psychological Bulletin. However, it is very complicated and it's really tough to follow. But if you need some backup for using this statistic, that's your go-to source. Let's move on. Well, we've seen that there are many, many different ways to measure score reliability. We also mentioned a few things that can influence score reliability. Here's a few more influences on reliability. The method used to measure reliability can result in different reliability scores for different reliability measures. Some measures provide higher estimates than others. For example, Cronbach's alpha might be high, say 0.80 for some measure of a transient emotion. But test-retest reliability might be very low since emotions are usually quite fleeting and short-lived. That is, the correlation between, say, boredom at time one and at time two might be near zero since one is rarely bored for long periods of time, except when maybe sitting through a really long tutorial on reliability. <clears throat> Individual differences among respondents may result in different reliability for one sample and not for another. Some respondents may not have the same reading ability as others and they may be confused by some test items while other people simply are not. The length of a measure affects reliability. We know that more items leads to higher reliability. As previously stated, an IQ test with one question is ridiculously unreliable. Test question difficulty affects reliability too. Questions of moderate difficulty increase the ability to differentiate between respondents. Again, a difficulty of 0.50 is best, which means sadly that half of the sample should get the question wrong. Ouch. Here are some more factors that affect the reliability of scores on a measure. The homogeneity of a measure's content affects reliability. An item should measure one thing only. It should, the test should be homogenous. The famous double-barreled question is the culprit here. For example, one would never use an attitude item like, I love fried chicken and ice cream. This should be split into two items. I love fried chicken and I love ice cream. 
because it's possible to love fried chicken but not ice cream or vice versa. So unidimensionality of items and homogeneity of the measure are a must. The response format is important too. Using a seven point Likert scale is better than a five point or a three point scale because it increases score variance or variability or the chance of making fine grained differentiation between respondent scores. The administration of a measure matters greatly. It's important to be consistent and use standardized conditions to improve score reliability. Each subject should get the exact same instruction every time, and the test should be administered in the same environment every time. Always read the pre-written instructions to every respondent or every sample verbatim. Let's move on. So far, we've sort of skirted around the topic of the number of items in a test. As the number of items increases to a certain point, the reliability of the instrument increases. That is, the reliability of tests can be improved by increasing the number of items in the test. Think for a second about an IQ test in which there are now only two questions. If you miss one, for whatever reason, can we reliably say that your IQ is 50? Probably not. In this case, your observed score is lower than your true score. If the reason that you missed it because it was poorly worded, with no correct answer maybe among the alternatives, then the, test re it, the test's reliability is attenuated or dampened. Split half reliability estimates are based upon scores on only one half of the items in a test because it pairs items up and the number of pairs is half the number of items. Because of this, it technically underestimates the true reliability of the instrument. So to correct for this inadequacy, the Spearman-Brown prophecy formula can be applied to give a more accurate measure of the test reliability, one that is based upon all the test items, all the possible test items. It actually tells us how much longer technically how many times longer, like twice as long, three times as long, etc., that the test has to be to achieve a predetermined level of reliability. Now, incidentally, the Spearman-Brown formula can be applied to any type of internal consistency reliability. For example, a scale that measures empathy may have only 10 items. If it had 100 items, we would be more likely to tap into the true score of empathy than if we had only 10 items, right? Yes, the score for 100 items that truly measure empathy would be more accurate than one that only uses 10. Notice that I said truly measures because the difficulty of writing items to measure empathy increases exponentially at a certain point. How many ways can you ask someone if they're able to put themselves in someone else's shoes and feel their pain or pleasure? Let's move on. Here's a nice diagram of the relationship between test length and reliability. The symbol R sub TT is the correlation of the test score with itself, which is the upper bound for score reliability. It is, in essence, the symbol for a test reliability. We see R sub TTs across this row. 0.20, R sub TT, 0.33, 50, 67, and 80. We see that on form A, with only five items, this very short test has really low unreliability. 0.20. As the test gets longer and longer, see test B, C, D, and E, the reliability gets larger and larger. This is because the test is merely a sample of the population of potential test items. As the sample size gets bigger and bigger, it more closely approximates the population of items. In essence, we are able to make stronger and better generalizations about the population of items when we have a large sample of items and also of people. Let's move on. When you see the word standard in statistics, it usually means average. 
The standard error of measurement, or SEM, is the average error contained in any one person's test score. The average amount of error contained in one person's test score. Remember, all scores are technically subject to measurement error. The standard error of measurement is used to detect the accuracy of that person's score on a test. It is a function of the distribution of scores for the group and the reliability of scores for the group. But it tells us how accurate any particular person's score is. If the SEM is small, then multiple administrations of the test on a given person will result in amazingly similar scores for that person. On the other hand, if the SEM is larger, then scores on repeated administrations of the test will likely vary greatly. To calculate it, you need the standard deviation of scores for the group, which is the measure of how widely scores are distributed around the mean score for the group. You also need the reliability of scores on the test. So multiply the standard deviation by the square root of 1 minus the reliability. 1 minus the reliability is the amount of unreliability, right? And then you, you get the SEM. If scores on a test are ultra-reliable, then R sub XS approaches 1. And the area under the square root symbol reduces to near 0, but never gets exactly to 0 since no test ever results in perfect reliability. Thus, as the area under the square root approaches 0, the SEM approaches 0 and indicates an extremely accurate measure. Please note that there are also standard errors of just about everything. They are critical to various statistical tests. There is a standard error of the mean, a standard error of the median, standard error of the estimate, as in multiple regression, and the list goes on and on. Because this lecture is about measurement, we need to understand the standard error of measurement. Let's move on. Here are some uses of the standard error of measurement. Since no test ever results in perfectly reliable scores, any single obtained score is really just an approximation of the true score. Remember classical test theory from early in the lecture. If a test is administered a number of times to the same respondent, their scores will likely be within a narrow band. Because test scores are never perfectly reliable, strict adherence to cut scores should be avoided. As long as the respondent scores within plus or minus one standard error of measurement, then it should be considered acceptable. For example, if a cut score of 80 or better is used for hiring purposes and an applicant scores 78, but the standard error of measurement is three, then it's certainly possible that their true score is actually between 75 and 81. Remember, they scored 78, minus three yields 75, plus three yields 81. Now, since 81 is above the cutoff threshold of 80, it should be an acceptable score. When comparing two respondent scores, they are not statistically significantly different unless they differ by about two SEMs. Technically, it is 1.96 SEMs. If you remember the stuff on Z scores, and that scores within 1.9 standard deviations to the left and 1.9 standard deviations to the right incorporate 95% of all observations under the normal bell curve. This suggests that only 5% of the observations are under the tails of the bell curve and are so extreme as to be unlikely. Similarly, if we want to compare mean scores for different groups of respondents, that is, males versus females, whites versus blacks, etc., we need to be able to establish bands or confidence intervals around the scores. The SEM does that for us. This is critical in making selection decisions covered at the end of the series of lectures. Let's move on. So I hope that you've learned a lot and that your brain is not too fried. Thanks. That's all, folks.